Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, hi everyone. Um, welcome to this keynote. Um, I just want to start by really appreciating the organizers who could like put things together last minute for me to still be able to give my talk virtually. Um, I'm so sorry I couldn't be there in person. It really hurts. Um, you know, li literally last minute couldn't travel. Uh, and that's why I'm doing this. So thank you so much for joining. I do realize that I am what's standing between you and lunch. So I'm going to try to make sure, uh, you know, this is interesting, but also uh, make sure there's there's enough time to you know you get to lunch early. So let us begin. Okay, so I have a clicker here. I just have to. Okay. So um, hi everyone. My name is Aisha. For those um, who don't know me, um, I'm I'm part of the board of trustees for Jungle Girls. Um, I really like this picture because. Um, this was in 2015 at Jungle Girls Bilbao, and, and I still was attending Euro Python as well as the conference. Um, I literally um, really love this picture because this is literally the day I would say my life took a turn and, you know, there was just endless possibilities. Uh, so a little bit about myself. Um, I work as a cloud solutions architect for AWS. Um, I'm also a board member for, uh, you know, Django Girls, you know, said that before. I also co-host the Django Girls podcast as well as the Rebellion podcast. Um, I was one of the co-founders for Pilates Nigeria um, and the Python Nigeria community. Um, and, you know, what started out as Python Africa. Uh, and I'm also like an ex-board member for the Python Nigeria community. Um, I love conferences. Like I said, so bummed that I'm, I can't be there. But like I used to, I also used to co-organize um, conferences like Python Nigeria and Help with Python Africa as well. Um, I have some news about that at the end, so stay tuned. So what would we talk about today? So on today's agenda, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Jungle Girls Impact. This really has been a while since our last impact uh, report. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the impact. Um, I'm going to talk about, you know, John Girls podcast. So you're going to hear like some of the stories. Um, I'm also going to talk about what it means to have like a sustainable jungle village because uh, it takes a village. Um, so I, and then I'll give an example of like what my village looks like, an example of my village. Um, we'll also talk about, you know, what does the, what does the future hold for jungle girls? What does it look like? And finally we'll discuss like how to get involved. All right. So let's start with some history, right? Um, for those who don't know, Jungle Girls was actually founded in 2014 at the then Europe Python by two Polish women, Ola and Ola, because they because of their own personal experiences at that time and you know what they went through while they were starting their programming journey. Um, and they wanted to like, you know, do things different. They wanted to create like an exciting curriculum that, that was not just fun and exciting but also created like a safe um and, and safe environment where anyone who identifies as you know a woman non-binary uh, could actually come and learn and fall in love in, with with programming so this was how jungle girls started and since 2014 um you know a lot has happened you know we did live through a pandemic uh but a lot has has, has happened so um, just to talk a little bit about um, the impact that we've had so far, um, since 2014, we've had an army of over 2,000 volunteers organize a, over 1,000 events in 580 cities um, and 108 countries all over the world. I mean, I was looking at the map, and I, I think the only thing I didn't see was um, Antarctica, so like say, let's say every other, <laughs> every other place, but except Antarctica. Um, so, and I think apparently we've also had, well, actually close to uh, 23,000 attendees. That is, that is people who have actually attended, not coaches, not mentors, not organizers, 20, 23,000 people almost who have actually been to a Jago Girls event. I'm one of such people and my story really has changed. So I can just imagine me times 23,000 and what that looks like all over the world. So super excited about these numbers. 
and and where we're going and you know what we'll continue to do um i really want to talk a little bit as well about um our jungle girls tutorial now during the pandemic we were not having any events we were not um you know everything everything was shut down um one of the things that you know that people started to turn to was to have the jungle girls tutorial and i think i saw um on youtube a sort of browsing randomly and literally i saw like there were there were like multiple youtube tutorials of jungle girls that Jungle, of the jungle tutorial that you know just that broke it down by like you know using a chromebook or using a windows or mac like and it was so so amazing and people actually turned to when they were even turned more to using the tutorial so as at um 2017 when we published the last impact um report we had 14 languages now we're at 20 we have a ton of language that are still not like published because we haven't um, sort of like verified. I personally would like to see more African lang um, indigenous languages as well, like, you know, show up on the tutorial. So by the way, if you're, if you're here, you're listening and you don't see your language on the list when you go to the tutorial website, this is your call to make it happen. Uh, we're always looking for people to help and volunteers. Um, and as of 2017 as well, when we published our impact report, um, 2017 and 2023, I don't know, can't remember, like that's what, three or well, six years apart uh we had one million people who had used the tutorial so you could literally say we had to we we had you know that many people use the tutorial but as at two days ago when we when we did run another query um the number had actually gone up to four million over four million people who have actually read the tutor tutorial or used the tutorial this is like unique users this is not like this is like four million people unique users who have actually used our jungle girls tutorial like, can you imagine um and it just goes to show like how you know beyond events beyond um you know the events that we run the impact we have even you know when people don't attend the event or they're not they don't have an event in their city um up next i'd like to talk about the jungle girls podcast so when um and at the end of 2021 when things started to like pick back up um and we and i and my course leona were ideating about you know you know you know what should we do differently um if you if you probably know we used to run an active blog called your jungle story or my jungle story and basically we would interview um sort of attendees who had been at the event we would ask them like you know you know what their favorite framework or uh, framework was you know like we would ask all these questions and it was in blog format like it was it was written and i and i just we just thought about you know how cool would it be if people could actually tell their stories in their own voice and we're like oh should we do like oh, we talked about it okay should we just do like a youtube channel which would be cool they're like oh man that's like too much work and so we ended up like going for like a podcast um and you know literally th that was literally what what happened and so in 2022 last year we actually started or started to publish um um sort of like episodes for the for the um podcast and and just in 2022 as well i just wanted to share like you know some of the things we did so um and, and i think one of the things that we wanted to learn beyond the jungle girl story was you know what are some of the challenges starting out like what was your life outside of attending or being or, or being involved with the jungle with jungle girls um you know what are what are, like just stories returning to tech changing career who are the people that helped along the way things like that we really wanted to hear firsthand from um you know people you know their experience with jungle girls and as of last year we actually published eight episodes that is like over 200 minutes worth of content um we actually have had a thousand five hundred plays or you know people listen across um 74 um countries so if you don't know about jungle girls podcast this is your cue to go on your favorite podcast platform do a search for jungle girls podcast subscribe follow um really literally um and and support and, and listen and share because you, you never know who needs to hear that story and it's some there's such something powerful about people actually telling their stories in their own words in their own voice um in spite of right um 
I so I literally so one of the things I also want to do is uh to do is share um you know some of the stories from the podcast by the by the way I'm not going to give you all the details no spoiler alert so that you actually go and actually listen to the episodes um but basically um when we um you know you know, just thinking about the hashtag, I am a jungle girl. I don't know if anyone remembers, but in July of 2017, it was our third birthday. By the way, we're gonna be nine years. The foundation is gonna be nine years this July, just one year shy of a decade. That's so cool. I can't believe that, you know, we've been a foundation that long. Um, but but basically we had, you know, at, on our third birthday, 2017, we had actually, you know, asked our Twitter community to share their experience on how Django Girls has impacted them. And basically what happens when, you know, if you actually still do this hashtag on Twitter, you see many people's stories of like, you know, what happened to them and how their life changed or what they did differently once they attended an event. Um, so I, I do want to use this as I am a Django Girl, um, you know, this, this hashtag, uh, just to preface like, you know, the podcast and some of the stories I'm gonna be telling. All right, so um, let's start with Maria. So during the pandemic, um, you know, Maria was, even before the pandemic, uh, Maria had like, a, was an occupational therapist. Um, and, you know, she actually decided to go into that role because she really wanted to help people. Um, and, you know, you know, then during the pandemic, like most people, you literally, you know, lots of people had, you know, there was more time on their hands. People started to rethink, you know, what they're going to do. And I think in that moment, Maria wasn't having like a lot of joy in her present career. Um, and, you know, she was just thinking like, what would she do? What would she do differently? Or what could she do that she could find, she could go back to finding joy, right? Um, and then she, you know, if anyone knows Rachel as well, Maria and Rachel are actually friends, long time friends, apparently. And Rachel is, is actually also a board member, Rachel Calhoun. She's also a board member. Um, and she actually transitioned, um, from a software to a software engineer. She used to be an awesome teacher. So from an awesome teacher to an awesome software engineer. So basically, um, so, you know, Rachel apparently had been trying to convince Maria to, you know, pick up, like, you know, attend an event, to actually attend an event then when events used to happen. And, and, you know, Maria just kept putting it off. It's like, yeah, yeah, one day, one day, that's okay. But during the pandemic, there's this opportunity to like, okay, what, are, what I'm really thinking about, you know, what to do next. So, you know, what's the harm? And so Rachel actually, so by this time, it was already during the pandemic. So there were no events, right? Nothing was happening. And it even took us a while before we started to approve virtual events, you know, and those were far and few in between, um, not like it was in person. Um, so, you know, Rachel, uh, sorry, Maria on her own actually went ahead to the Jungle Girls tutorial and went through the tutorial, got some help from Rachel as well. And, you know, and as she went through the tutorial, she started to see, oh, this is something that I could, I could do, um, you know, and especially, you know, when you're trying to switch a career, especially switch to a different career, especially if you've done that career for a long time, you question yourself a lot in the beginning. It's like, like, you know, what could I possibly know? I do not have a computer science or a computer engineering background, um, you know, and, and she, Mary actually found out that there's actually tons of transferable skills as an occupational therapist that would make her an amazing or better software engineer. So, um, so if you think about, um, so if I, if I just think about what Maria said, and we, we asked Maria, and you know, it's like, what is what, if you could go back in time, what is, we usually always ask this question, if you could go back in time and change one thing, what would you do? And Maria is like, I should have done this so sooner. I should have done this like 10 years ago. I should have transitioned sooner. Um, and that was like, you know, super awesome. So yeah, so that's Maria's story, a bit about it. Go listen to the full episode. Um, the next story I want to talk about, you all know her. She was, she just did a keynote, Dawn Wages. I always tell Dawn, I'm like, your name, your first name and your last name is the, is the, is like, it's a, it's like two of my favorite things. Like the Dawn, so it's beautiful with a, with a nice sun, uh, you know, when the sun comes up and wages, cause we all have to make money. Right. Um, so, so, uh, so Dawn, um, Johnny started way back, you know, she, she remembers, tinkering with like, you know, 
stuff with a, a home computer way back when she was in high school. But you know, her journey, you know, has taken like different waves because she started out wanting to do finance right after school. Um, and then she was like, okay, maybe she'll pivot to being an, uh, a data analyst and started to try to do some things, but nothing really like stuck. So it wasn't until um, Django Con 2016 in Philadelphia, I actually was at that event. Uh, it's funny, I didn't see Don, but like literally we're like, we were both at the same conference at the same time, <laughs> uh, but literally, uh, so it wasn't until she actually attended that event that, you know, she, she actually deployed a website, uh, so a blog by herself, um, during the workshop. And she's like, oh my gosh, like, if I can do this, what else can I possibly do? Like, hear me now, I'm not powerful, hear me raw. And then, and then it just kickstarted like that push she needed to finally get into the space. Um, and I think she still had roles in like projects. She was still working as a project manager. Um, and then, you know, because of like the community she met at the event and even outside of that with like the meetup communities as well, she was able to really take a career to the next step and do something that she really loves to do. And the people and people literally gave her the space to learn and to grow and to make mistakes. Um, and you know, Dawn is here today. She you know she was a keynote speaker. How great is and how cool is that, right? Um, you know, we take no credit, just saying. Uh, <laughs> so that's like super awesome. Um, the next couple of stories I do want to talk about um is Anne Ba like if anyone knows Anne Anne is such a she's amazing she's like she's like a mentor to many of us she supports the community and you know Anne also came on the podcast and told us about her story about how you know she literally you could you can literally trace and story to way back as the days of basic and pascal when that was still when people still cared about those languages um and you know she used to work at a job that required her to travel a lot and you know as she started to like grow her family she just realized that, that she needs to take a step back because the logistics just, just didn't quite work out um and you know Anne actually takes us on her journey on what it what it felt like and what it was like returning to tech after taking a long time off right but it's so amazing because in that time when Anne was technically away from tech she started a business she got a psychologic uh, a psychology degree um and you know and she she did tons of stuff and then returned it and then returned uh, back to tech as as a developer and now she's a consultant and you know last i checked last year pycon uk she was actually the conference um director so yeah that's a bit about Anne's story you have to go we listen to the full episode yourself no spoilers um the next story i want to talk about is hara um uh, let me see okay so Kara is like a bundle of joy like even when you hear her talk she's like she's like she just wants to change the world so she's like a big advocate for for stem for diversity for getting more people into tech but Kara actually started as a survey engineer right um she's actually studied bioinformatics um and you know she she was she was working as a survey engineer and she just you know you know it's just something and as it always is like something was missing she had to you know take it to the next um level and then that was when she attended like a jungle girls event and that was how her journey started and now she's actually on the board of trustees for jungle girls advisory board she's a huge advocate for the team supporting um you have to go listen to, to that episode because she takes us through how now she's 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 a software engineer as a satellite operator i'm like you you work with satellites every day it's like whoa that is so cool so that is Hara's story so i want to you know transition from like some of the stories we've had hopefully like you know you'll go and listen to the episodes and and i mean as a co-host like i personally have been blessed inspired you know by these stories all right So it takes a village to raise a child. It's an African proverb. Um, what this means is that 
it, it, it means like an entire community of people must interact with children for those children to grow in a safe and healthy environment. Um, this proverb actually became even more popular when Hillary Clinton back in 1996 actually wrote a book, It Takes a Village. Uh, and she, you know, she wrote the book in the context of what it meant for like the American society. Um, and, and I just want to preface this by saying, um, I, there was a time, I, I think I'll call myself a Pythonist, a, a, a child Pythonist, a baby jangonaut, right? And I think where I am today is as a result of the entire community that have helped and have shaped my career, my progress, my growth in every way, shape and form, right? So one of the things I want to go into is Talk about who makes up the village. What is what is the village? What does the African village look like? And how do we translate that to the jungle village? All right. So I mean, ideally, when you think about a village, you probably would start with like, well, I mean, technically, a child village very pretty much starts with like parents, siblings, um, cousins, maybe. And if you're fortunate, you probably had grandparents and many times there's tons of knowledge that are passed from like grandparents you know like I, you know just personally I, I just remember you know just sitting with my grandma and just hearing all the stories from way back when and how, how things used to be right um and you know this is by far not exhaust exhaustive because the village actually transcends the nuclear unit um it, it, uh, and even the extended unit the village has so many people so to start with, like the village primarily consists of the neighbors, the residents, the people who live in the village. So I remember, um, I, I'm going to tell you all a story. So growing up, um, I and my siblings, you know, as part of being a teenager, we would, you know, we, we didn't have a driver's license. We didn't know how to drive. Uh, but we would we would take our dad's car because we would, we if we figured we'd watched enough movies, we'd seen our dad drive um, a ton of time, and we figured like well we could actually probably do this. It doesn't look like rocket science, so we literally took our dad. We we had been taking our dad's car out, you know, when obviously he's not home, and you know he he leaves the car keys and. I remember this one time we went we went out to the car we always check we always make sure nobody's there it's like it's like the, it's like we go during when there's nobody at home even even within the the, the area uh, because most people have gone to work or something and so we me and my siblings take out this car we come back you know when you, you take the car out you like you know how you took the car you know where the stair how the steering was aligned you know you you, you know exactly the where the 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 parking space where the car was parked. So we sort of like had it to a detail and we took the car out, we brought it back and make sure we you know, put everything so that nobody would notice, right? We'd gotten away with it quite a few times. And I remember my dad coming back home from work and he's like, tell me the truth. What did you guys do? Like, just, uh, what did you people do? Just confess. I'm going to give you an opportunity to tell me what you've done. And then we were like, oh my gosh, this man must know. Does he have magic? How did he know? Like, we're also very careful. But it turned out that we had a neighbor who saw us sneaking out with our dad's car and coming back and, you know, eventually like gave my dad the heads up. And, you know, it's and, th and that's really literally what the characteristic is of, an, of a village. Um, you know, everybody is like, you know, including your neighbors, brings up the child. Um, there's no such thing as, oh, everybody minds your business. In fact, it's actually really normal for a neighbor, an adult in the village to actually see you and reprimand a child if they see the child doing something wrong. So it wasn't uncommon to, you know, for like the whole, anybody, any adult could see a child maybe not crossing the road well or just doing something wrong that would put the child in harm's way um you know everybody every, it's, so that child is everybody's child everybody comes together and continues to look out for the child regardless of whose child it is and the village by definition usually you know signifies like a a community a tightening community um and you know a neighbor will not see something wrong and actually keep quiet so this picture i like uh, so this umoja village is actually a village out in kenya it's actually a, a, a women only village and it was founded by women who were fleeing 
um, abuse and persecution and and they founded this village and it's actually a refuge um they have an entire system like it's, it's actually a refuge for many women who are fleeing similar um things and so how does that what does that look like in the when we think about the context of our jungle community right in our python community everybody everybody every community member where you're whether you're a baby jungle not a baby pythonista whether you are you know an og and you've been around like as long as the language um whether you're in the in, in between um every single person makes up the village right i really like this picture it's amazing it's like it's in brazil jungle girls brazil super cool so let's look at some of the other residents of the village um we also in an african village we also have the council of elders um the council of elders have usually have many roles in many cases they settle um family disputes they reconcile members maybe there's like a land dispute for example they usually take um, decisions that benefit the the community um usually most um the monarchs the kings um usually would delegate they have like a elders council of elders or chiefs for example that they delegate you know you know decision making to so that you know the, the the king for example is not overwhelmed um so it's only when an issue cannot be solved or rectified by the elder that they take it up to like um to like the king so um elders can also serve as mentors as well um you know they offer similar to the african village they offer like wisdom and advice based on their life experiences in the same way um elders we we elders play the function of making sure that our, the history the culture the stories are passed on from generation to generation right um and when i think about what the elders are in our in our context i think about um the community leaders like the board members even you know people who come to they're usually mentors as well right because you know naomi for example is, is, is an amazing you know, it was an amazing mentor of mine as well when I started out. Um, so community leaders literally, you know, they provide guidance, moderation, they provide direction to members. Um, and just like elders um, of a village, they also make decisions for the community, but they always take that. And we always say like, you know, uh, we have this saying that what an elder sees sitting down, a child can tr climb to the highest Iroko tree and still not see it, right? Um, and you know, which just signifies this because of the ton of experience. You know, elders usually have they have the vision, they see the vision, they see well into the future, um, and you know, make decisions to benefit that future that they that they're looking for. Um, so when I think about how that translates for uh, um, our community, um, the board members they take feedback from everybody else and they use that to make informed decisions about the direction of where the, our village, our jungle village, our community is headed. All right, let's go to another member of the community. Um, let's see, okay. Um, when we think about the founders of the village, right? These are or founders of you know our, our African village, and we think about our ancestors. Um, and our village ancestors usually they have the role of helping to preserve the cultural heritage and traditions of the community. Um, the <clears throat> the kings, the founders, for example, are you know usually kings. Would, from a village you usually probably come from the lineage of like the founders right and and the leader so what happens is like those generation those cultural beliefs are actually passed on from generation um to to generation um so while like um you know the concept of like you know the ancestors for example i always think about the ancestors i always think about founders as we stand on the shoulders of giants we are where we are today we are who we are today because of the people who have come before us and have paved the way and have created something um that we have turned into a community and we've turned into this um global um concept so when i think about what that means for like our our community right you know you'd be like oh yeah i sure super easy you know if you think about the founder of python guido Russell, if you think about um you know the founders of jungle as well and how that started i just particularly want to call out a, one of the earliest um pioneers for the jungle community 
Malcolm Trednik. Um, for those who don't know, Malcolm was a pioneer. He was one of the very earliest contribute core contributor to Django. He was a um, he was a um, it was a huge part of 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 um, the community. He was he was actually one of the earliest mentors as well for many people who were you know starting out with Django, even as far back as the earliest versions of two scoops of Django. Uh, Malcolm was part of, um, you know, was literally part of the people that helped and reviewed as well. Um, it's actually super important to recognize um, Malcolm because um, every year we have an award that was called the Malcolm Trednik Award. It's a way we used to honor his memory and honor all the con contributions he's done for the community. Um, and basically we are standing on the shoulders of the giants and the people that came before us. Um, so yeah, just, you know, so when I think about, you know, some of our, all, some of the pioneers, um, you know, who's really, really were a huge part of the Django village, Django community, you cannot really go without, you know, bringing up Malcolm's name. So let's move to next set of people who make up the village. I think about um, teachers, in the village, tradespeople, and their job is literally day to day is to make sure that they're impacting knowledge um, based on their experience, based on their skills. Because so even before the concept of formal training, teachers would come to sorry, uh, we had tradespeople, you know, blacksmiths, craftsmen. We had people who were you did sculptures and art and textiles, and these people had apprentices and you know, would pass on that knowledge to the next, to the youth, to the next generation. And it's very important. Like it's, it's almost like it's, it's super important to make sure that the knowledge, the stories are being passed on from generation to generation. Um, so when I think about that in concept of our Django village, I think about our coaches, our mentors, I think about like all the skillful um, people as well. And even business people who create those opportunities for, um you know people to learn as well and sorry for, for people for either the the baby janglers or the child janglers expand their skills and knowledge um to grow and provide guidance and, and encouragement especially when things get hard because they're coming from and talking from experience um the final set of um people i want to talk about by the way this is not an exhaustive list this is just, you know, some of the major people that make up, make up the village, makes up the village. Um, I'd like to talk about um, the vigilante, the warrior. So way, way back there before the concept of like police officers and the army and the Navy and all of these things, um, whenever there was a security issue in an African or in a village, um, depending on what the issue was, you would have maybe the youths band together and they would form, you know, the warrior group. You would have maybe, you know, people like the hunters or the farmers come together, depending on, you know, if it was theft late at night, they would actually have this watch night and have like a roaster. And in turns, they like do like a walk about, they, 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 they walk around and check and, you know, with their own arms as well, making sure that, you know, whoever is doing the crime is caught or, you know, is scared by virtue of you knowing that people are going to be out watching for you and, and not do the crime. Um, so I really like this picture. If you've ever watched Woman King, um, the Woman King is literally based off of the Minos, um, you know, in Dahomey, in the Daomi Kingdom, present day Benin Republic. And this was an all female warrior group, especially during the transatlantic um, slave trade. And, and they fought many battles and won many um, and I, I just, you know, some people call them the Amazonians, some people, they're the Minos, um, they are Gojis, you know, they have, they, they went by very different names, but they were a very revered, fair female warrior group um, <clears throat> in West Africa. If I translate that to what it looks like to our community, I mean, <clears throat> like it goes without saying our code of conduct. Uh, everyone here had to sign sign and acknowledge the code of conduct. Even for us doing presentations, we had to present our slides ahead of time so that it goes through code of conduct review. The code of conduct is how we ensure that everybody, just like the warriors and the vigilante group, had to make sure that the safe the streets were safe and crime was non-existent. 
um, our code, the code of conduct team comes together and make sure that, you know, during an, an event or gathering such as these, um, you know, we're keeping, um, we're making sure that we're providing an enabling community that is safe for everyone, that, 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 that includes everyone and creates a positive environment for everyone. And that's why, you know, when you break the code of conduct, it's taken very seriously and there's violations and there's consequences. Um, so yeah, so this is the Django con code of conduct. We all had to sign it. We all had to go through it. Uh, just wanted to, to, to point that out. So I want to pivot now. And now that we know all the people that makes up a village, a successful village and how that applies to our village, I want to talk about what a healthy Django village looks like. What a healthy village looks like, what a healthy Django community. I'm going to be using the terms, um, intertwined. Um, so when I, when I think about a village, I also think, I think about how everyone's voices is heard and taken seriously. Remember how I talk about the elders of the village always passing on information to the youth, to the younger generation. It was also as, as much as that was being done and, you know, the elders had a lot of wisdom and they also had to learn from the other, so the youths, the children of the community. Um, you know, we've all, we've all sort of had experiences where we had engaged in a conversation with a five-year-old and literally learned something like it's it's how it's it's how because of that because learning is a two-way street like even when as mentors as coaches we have men you have mentees you actually find that you're learning just as much from that interaction as the, the mentee is actually learning from the mentor. Um, so it goes without saying that it is very important that everyone's voices be heard, including the baby the children or the babies of the of the village um because at the end of the day we make culture we make tradition tradition doesn't make us so it's important that elders and you know people the people of the village uh, sorry the elders the founders all of that listen to the younger than not just the younger but like the next generation um the younger people in the village um so that with time, the culture, the tradition would have to improve. It would have to change. Like when the Django, when Django community started many years ago and what the Django community looks like, there's been tons and tons of changes in our bylaws and how things, in, in how, you know, we recruit um, the Django core team. And that's because the, 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 the elders, the people who are leaders have to listen to the community, take feedback, make informed decisions that benefit the entire community, but also our forward looking and outward looking to what the future of the community is. So everybody has to be taken seriously. The next um, point is that everybody cares and supports in various capacities. Sometimes it's, you're not an elder or you're not, uh, sorry, you're not a community leader, you're not a organizer maybe all you do is just respond kindly to stack overflow questions everybody has a role to play everybody supports in the capacities that they can afford um or they can they, whatever that they can do um i think one of the things that i wanted to mention was if we think about it if everybody every i mean when i say everybody i'm saying everybody everybody in the community does one small thing, one simple, doesn't have to be simple, just does one thing, nothing is ever really simple. Um, just think about what that would look like and how much growth that will come. But if only a few people have to do everything, you have burnout, you have people dropping out, you have people, it's not sustainable. That kind of village is not sustainable. Sustainable. So everybody doing everybody doing something, performing an action, you know, contributing in all, one, one way, shape or form actually does help um, the community in the large, larger run that is, and, and that's what makes a sustainable community. Um, everyone is given an opportunity to contribute. So no gatekeeping. Um, it doesn't matter where you where you come from. It doesn't matter like you, every, many people have transferable skills. Many people are able to contribute in one way, shape or form. Um, not, not, you, you know, everybody cannot be a, a, you know, everybody cannot, everybody cannot only do one thing, right? Um, because if everyone did one thing, you know, the other parts or aspects of the community wouldn't survive. Um, so this is actually super important. And the final one is sharing isn't only caring, sharing is actually how we survive. Um, I remember a story, my grandma, you know, my grandma just used to tell me how growing up when they grew up, like way, 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 way back in the 
early 1900s or something she used to tell us how for example like if you had a family of hunter hunters for example or gatherers or farmers whatever is hunted that day the whole family takes part of so if for example all the hunters go out but one hunter catches one animal that's what the entire family is not just the nuclear family the extended family so it's usually like in a compound and there are different houses for different family members every single person gets a portion of that meat and nobody goes hungry um and even even when they will catch like a hunter will go and it will catch like a huge animal um i don't know think about anything huge i don't know hippo for example what would happen is that the entire village actually shares in that in that food so there was no wastage nobody went hungry um even things like homelessness wasn't possible because no matter where you go or how far you go there is always they can always trace your roots down to your family home and you would you would have a place to sleep you, you never i would never i've ne personally never been to my indigenous village but i know if i go there we have my great great grandfather there's a family house somewhere and there's a place for me to, to to stay um so yeah so just you know sharing is the only way we survive and when we think about sharing in the context of our community we think about how by virtue of who we are as an open source community literally everything that we do from the projects that we do the code that we write the, the our communities everything that we do is usually open source and available for free for other people to take and use it for their own personal purposes or for them to actually improve um improve it um for them to actually um you know utilize it anybody can access and, and improve on it or reuse it right and that's that's how we we survive as we continue to share as we continue to grow and so you know beyond that like if you know on an individual level you know sharing your time is actually as in, is also as as important as well right when we when we think about the collective all right so i just wanted to quickly touch on what my village looks like um so um very quickly my village um when i asked when I start with naomi naomi <clears throat> was psf chair for for a while she was my mentor i met her at europe python and she was one of the very early supporters from the PSF who made sure that when we were starting the Python Nigeria community, the Python African community, we had everything that we needed to make sure that we were successful. I can tell you for a fact that up to today, Naomi is still literally an admin on the um, Python Nigeria, Python Africa mailing list and actually still goes in every once in a while and like, you know, approves when, when nobody does it, right? Um, so, she, you know, Naomi, if you've ever met her, she's super amazing. She's done tons of talks as well. Um, the next person in my community I want to talk about is Helen. So super, super early on, it's sorry, in my village. By the way, this is not an exhaustive list. I'm just, I'm just trying to highlight like different people in my village um, and the different roles that they had when I was coming up. When I think about Helen, Helen literally, um, when I was starting, I'd met Daniel in PyCon UK. He was he was doing, he was organizing PyCon Namibia. And I remember asking him, I'm like, whoa, is there a jungle girls happening at PyCon Namibia? And he's like, there could be, meaning nothing that happened has started to happen. And I remember once I was like, oh, we should do something about that. But I didn't have any experience organizing an event. And I was also trying to do the first Jungle Girls Lagos, the first event in Nigeria. And you know, Helen earlier on had some experience organizing. And even if you know she's like 10,000 miles away, she joined her and literally helped to organize from the very beginning to the very end. So I wanted to just give her a shout out. Um, when I think about Catherine, there was actually a time after after the after i had done the jungles event that i was actually considering a career in data science and Catherine was super amazing walking me through you know just like helping me with some of the projects that i was working on um you know encouraging me to speak up pi data back then and helping me look through my proposal she just committed time and i always used to find it like oh my gosh like you know she doesn't know me from anywhere and just because of the community she's willing to dedicate her time and energy to make sure that i'm successful right uh so i just wanted to call Catherine out the other person is chuku chuku d chooks a great friend of mine he was actually one of the co-founders of the python Nigeria community i mentioned chooks because when i was starting the python community it's like who is this baby pythonista who who just went to a workshop like you know 
two months ago and wants to start a whole community that is going to include like experts and people who have been doing Python for like a long time. Um, Truks actually had tons of experience because he's been doing Python for a long time. Um, and he really joined and just, you know, made sure, added credibility pretty much and, you know, made sure that we got everything working and bringing in some of his other colleagues as well to be part of the community. Um, I want to talk about Lucy. Lucy was actually my Django Girls coach, and then she went on to become a Django Girls awesome, awesome ambassador. And literally, she um, really helped when we were organizing multiple events, providing support. So I wanted to do a shout out to Lucy. And finally, I want to talk about Daniel Roy Greenfield. Daniel actually is co uh, co-author of two scripts of Django and Daniel actually in the beginning when we started the Python Nigeria community, most employers were not really hiring, they, they didn't really do Python in Nigeria. Um, so Daniel was actually one of the very first people who were encouraging, you know, Python developers and, you know, people who had skills in, in Nigeria to actually get remote opportunities, like providing support, donating books to the conferences and, you know, personally like providing support for events as well. So I just wanted to give like a, a shout out to, to Daniel. So when I think about what a sustainable village looks like, I think about, you know, a story about this broomstick where if you take one strand, you can, you know, cut it in, you can easily break a, a strand of broom. But if you take it together, it's very hard to break it at the same time. So there's this African adage that says the strength of the broom lies not in the power of a single front, but in the resilience of its united front. And I feel that's what a sustainable village is about. Um, so what does the future hold, right? We're gonna to continue to do the Jungle Girls podcast. We actually should start like, um, you know, recording episodes, you know, in the next couple of months. Um, we have a different plan uh, for, for what we wanna do this year for the podcast um, in terms of like focusing more on the different career options outside of software engineering that many jungles attendees, you know, go on to do. Um, we, you know, we, there was a time when it was a taboo to have a Jungle Girls event sorry, when it was a taboo to host a conference, like a Django Con, a PyCon, and not have a Django Girls event. Um, so we need to change that. We need to make sure that we're doing more events and reaching out so that it, it's an amazing experience when attendees attend an event, but it's even more amazing when they can also be part of a conference and be part of a larger community. And that's what really helped me in my journey. Um, for the tutorial, we're always looking for people to help us with the tutorial, new languages, update the existing ones if anything has changed. And we'll be really trying to think of ways that we can, you know, have more recognition um, for of people who contribute to the community. Um, there are many ways you can help. Um, we're, you know, constantly looking for volunteers. We're constantly looking for, we all constantly have tickets on GitHub that needs to be resolved. Um, you know, there are just so many ways. You can be a mentor or coach. You can volunteer your time. You can actually support us by being a patron or sponsor us. We're always on the lookout for like corporate sponsorship, patrons, uh, or you can just spread the word, share the, share the tutorial, share the podcast. You never know who in your network needs to hear and needs that push that they, let it be the push that they need to, to do what they want to do. Um, and finally, I just wanted to add this as a plug, DjangoCon Africa is coming this year in November. Uh, if you haven't heard, go onto the website, sign up. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be in um, Tanzania. So if you have any questions, actually, you can ask, um, um, you would see Anna is, Anna is a jungle girl. So Anna, if you can hear me, just raise up your hand. So Anna is um, our financial, everything for jungle girls organization um but she's also one of the key organizers for jungle con africa you can ask her any question um as well i also want to call on claire claire if you're there raise your hand um so if you have any questions about the community as well find claire and she probably if you, if you have any questions claire we always say she's like the bank of all our knowledge base <laughs> she she literally would have the answer also if you're interested in coming on the jungle girls podcast um, Leona should be there. Leona, raise up your hand if you can hear me. Um, please talk to Leona. We're looking, we're actually recording in a couple of weeks and we're looking for people uh, to come on the podcast um, to tell their stories. So thank you every, everyone um, for coming to this um, talk. I hope it's been informative. Feel free to reach out. Um, you know, those are my contact details. Um, yeah, I will take questions. I have some minutes. Sorry, this went on too long. 
Uh, but I'm happy to take any questions if, if they exist. And I have the team on ground as well who can field any questions that I don't have the answer to. Aisha, thank you very much. I think that's worth a big round of applause. Aisha, you talk impact. I really love that. That's very impressive. Um, we have time for questions. So there's still two microphones to the right and to the left, and there's one walking around. Questions, please. There, go to the microphone here on your right. There's a microphone. Hi, Isha. It was a great talk. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to give, um, or I have a question on how someone who may be interested in Django Girls or you know someone who may want to get into web development, we're already in Django and we want to encourage them to start or join a Django Girls. What should they know when they first start or how can we help them when they finish to be the Django knot that they're aspiring to be? Thank you, that's, that's kind of like a loaded question because really after the event, there's a life after the event um, and you find that many people who attend the event actually need that support. And that has happened as a result of like organizations, even as an organization, I think about the trace people in the village, uh, they provided job opportunities. It's very often you come to conferences and then they're like, oh, we're looking for experienced developers. But then there's this person who's come out from an event and who needs help. Um, who needs to put what they've learned in practice um, and need the opportunity to intern, you know, or join as a junior, right? Um, so I think that's one of the ways that we can help provide more of those opportunities because at the end of the day, the senior engineers, senior developers all started out junior and started from somewhere, right? So providing more of those opportunities would be super helpful. Um, if you're new and you're trying to get into, into the web development space, general girls always say it's a nice fun way to start, but it doesn't end there. Um, you know, attending a Jungle's event or even just, you know, looking at a tutorial by yourself if it's not coming to your city. Or actually, you don't actually have to have attended the event to actually organize one, right? Uh, and to be part of one. So that's really the ways I would, I would, you know, recommend. Hope that answers your question. Daniela. Is this on? Hello, Aisha. It's Daniela here. Hi. I can hey, see you. Daniela. Nice to see you, if you, even if you can't <laughs> see me. Um, I know. <laughs> um, thank you very much for your thoughts on the village. Um, towns and cities are important too because they bring a certain scale with them. How can we develop towns and cities that still manage to have some of the values that you've talked about? In other words, how can we grow and develop in scale without losing those values? And do you think that we, we need to, or maybe we, do, we don't need to? I think we need to. I think that um, we want, at the end of the day, we want a village, we want a town, we want cities that are big, that is big enough to accommodate everyone, but small enough to accommodate every individual needs. I think that like as a huge community, there are many different, you know, like if I think about the Python community, for example, um, even though we have the broader Python community, and you would call that the, maybe the town or the country, right? Um, the villages are like the small groups that people can come together intimately for a purpose. So we always do not make things like Django's events, more than 30 attendees and have a one to three ratio because it's not really about the numbers, it's more about the impact. And you can do more when you can meet people at an individual level, because even when you coach or you mentor, every single person is at different points of the tutorial throughout the day, right? Every person needs something different. So creating an environment where, you know, pilot these, they do small events, um, Transcode do small events, Jungle's do small events, different meetup groups do small events that are intimate. So making sure that the village that is close knit exists in cities and towns is how we literally continue to make sure that even the bigger cities are sustainable as well. That's, that's my take. At at least. <laughs> Thank you. There's one more question there. Yes. Uh, hello. Thank you for the talk. Uh, your talk basically talked about uh, the village and the village that you described is basically a global village. And it, it really like comes off as a, a continuation of the 
uh, previous question, like how can Django Girls or any of our communities promote the local villages? And, uh... um, if you see a gap, as is with anything open source, try and fill it in your local community. Like many times, even for the events, like it's literally somebody within that community or city that's like oh this is, doesn't exist here we should bring it down here there are many people who need it i think doing more of that and you know you don't even you don't even, you don't have to have been a jungle girl attendee to actually organize or you know create an event especially when you're expert when you're sorry when you've been around for a while when you whether you're a mentor or a coach um I've seen people do that with their companies, their small local companies and do events within those small companies to make sure that, you know, they're locally, not, they're not just locally supporting and sponsoring, they're providing the people and the expertise to be there in person to mentor, you know, the up and coming, you know, people who are trying to make the, the, the career change. Um, I think we just always, it's at an individual level, we, we all have a role to play. Okay, that's the question. Yes. Thank you, Aisha. Um, so let's say if you know some people who use Python and Django, uh, but you wouldn't necessarily describe them as active members of the community, or maybe they don't cons even maybe they don't even consider themselves as part of the community. Do you have any ideas or um, strategies as how you could uh, help someone open their eyes that they are actually a member of this community and that they could um, get value from it themselves, like you were saying before, but also um, share their knowledge and their, that, their value to, to the wider community. Mm, yeah, that's a tough question because everyone is different and it depends on the person and their beliefs and um, and sometimes it's like, it's such, it could be such a big community or it could be overwhelming and people are like, yeah, I don't think anybody needs my help, right? Um, many people who already are like Django Nauts or Pythonistas uh, probably, they probably do some sort of like, um, they would usually tend towards, you know, contributing to the language itself, um, you know, like GitHub, you know, depend on the organization, uh, depend on the person. Um, and there's some take the next step and become like coaches. Um, it's a very, it's a very packed question. I'm not even sure how to answer it. Um, I think it really depends. I think them attending conferences like this, events like this, you know, would open their eyes. And that's why we always, I mean, the organizers always try to make sure there's a community focused talk in every keynote. Um, and I think that helps it op open their eyes to see other ways that they could be contributing that they didn't know about. Like I said, sometimes even just answering questions kindly on Stack Overflow is more than what any beginner, for example, could ask for, so that they don't feel like they're asking a stupid question. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. I think it's worth a great applause. Do I hear you? <laughs> yes, I do hear you. And uh, since we're all at the conference right now, some of us will eventually have to travel home. Maybe that's a good opportunity to listen to that podcast, the Jungle Girls podcast. I would appreciate it. Thank you very much Thank indeed. You. Thank you. And then